Elijah Research, uh, decided to revamp this lecture series a little bit and start bringing in some internationally renowned speakers. And it was decided at that time to name this the Truman Lecture Series uh, due to the fact that most worshipful brother Truman said this as part of the vision when he created the Elijah Research. And I commented to Clifton a couple of days ago, never in my wildest dreams did I think that the grandson of most worshipful brother Truman would be visiting our great state and speaking to us. With that, I would like to read quickly a, a bio for Clifton. He is, the, of course, the oldest grandson of former U.S. President Harry S. Truman and the son of late E. Clifton Daniel Jr., who is the former managing editor of the New York Times and best-selling mystery writer Margaret Truman. Brother Daniel is the honorary chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Harry S. Truman Library Institute in Independence, Missouri. He is a frequent speaker and fundraiser and the author of the 1995 book, Growing Up With My Grandfather, Memories of Harry S. Truman. And Dear Harry, Love Best, Best Truman's Letters to Harry Truman, 1919-1943, published in 2011. With that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Brother Clifton Truman Daniel. So, okay. Morning, brothers, uh, family, friends, grandmaster, past grandmasters, future grandmasters. There's a lot of gold in this room this morning. Um, I, I, am, I have on more microphones than, than I need. I'm wearing one for the camera, I've got one in front of me and one on my lapel. They can probably hear me in space at this point. Um, I, this morning, because we are, we are meeting, uh, because of the Lodge of Research, the, the, the opening of the Lodge of Research, I'm gonna talk about how being Harry Truman's grandson led me into a, uh, a research and writing career when I had no intention of embarking on one at all. I was a journalist and a public relations uh, guy for, uh, for the last 29 years, on and off. Uh, and I have written, as, as Aaron said, I've written two books about my family. The one was pretty much my experience growing up in that family, and the other was my grandmother's letters. Um, my grandparents and my parents tried to keep our lives very normal, given, given the background. And I, I had no idea that my grandfather had been president of the United States until I was six years old. And that's because my parents didn't tell me. <laughs> they, um, I, I found out in school. I went to school one morning, and um, somebody walked up to me and said, wasn't your grandfather president of the United States? And my brilliant reply was, I don't know. And I went home that afternoon, <laughs> and my mother loved to tell this story. You know, parents love to tell stories about the silly things their children do. I do it to my children. And I walked into the door, and I dropped my briefcase, and I marched across the living room to my mother, and I stood in front of her. I said, Mom, did you know? <laughs> and she looked at me sadly, and she said, yes. But just remember something. Any little boy's grandfather can be president. Don't let it go to your head. <laughs> It didn't go to my head, it went right over my head. I was six years old, I had no idea what that meant. Uh, and I found this out with my daughter, Amy. She's now 25, and <laughs> fully aware. But at the age of six, she and I were, were channel surfing, and we landed on a biography of my grandfather, and I stopped and I said, Amy, look, that man right there, that's Harry S. Truman, 33rd President of the United States, he was your great-grandfather. And she said, Daddy, go back, you passed Nickelodeon. <laughs> meant nothing to her. For me, my grandfather, you know, in the early days when I was very young, Grandpa was just somebody who came around the house. He was Grandpa. And he, he always had on a coat and tie, if not a suit, and he was kind of stern. And you, you either accorded him a great deal of respect, or you avoided him entirely. <laughs> and you avoided him because if you weren't careful, he'd try to teach you something. <laughs> and I... I told this story the other morning at the opening. I'll tell it again. I, uh, Grandpa stayed down the street at the Carlisle Hotel from our apartment. My mother had lived there when she was a singer and performer in the uh, early 1950s. Grandpa had the same routine every morning. Got up and took a one-mile walk at 120 steps a minute. 
and came back, got some breakfast, grabbed the newspaper, as many as he could find, brought him up to our apartment, let himself in, threw the newspapers on the floor and read until somebody else woke up. Could take a while in my house. And my brother and I were down early one morning and we found Grandpa behind the New York Times in the living room and we started to tiptoe past him to get to the television set in the den. And he put the paper down and he caught us and he said, where do you think you're going? We said, into the den to watch cartoons. He said, you don't want to do that. And of course I was thinking, of course, yes I do. <laughs> and he walked between us into the den, he took a book off the top shelf and he said, come here and sit by me. And we did. You didn't argue with him, we sat down. And he opened the book and started to read. And my mother came down about 20 minutes later, half asleep, and stopped cold in the living room. She'd never seen anything like this before. The two of us were sitting absolutely stone still on either side of Grandpa while he read to us from a book that didn't have one picture in it. <laughs> and she said, what are you reading to those kids? And he showed her the book. It turned out to be Thucydides, The History of the Peloponnesian War. <laughs> And it was not the Mickey Mouse version. <laughs> I took that book down <laughs> years ago. I went home to visit my mother. I took that book off the shelf and I got myself a glass of wine and I sat in the living room and I opened it up and I started to read. I got about two pages into it, closed the book and finished the wine. It is, <laughs> it is tough stuff to read. But that was what was very important to my grandfather. Uh, he, uh, it was said that by the time he and Charlie Ross, his press secretary, best friend press secretary, graduated high school, they had read all of the 2,000 volumes in the Independence Public Library. One of the earliest presents my grandfather got from my great-grandparents was a four-volume set called Great Men and Famous Women. Each of those books is a doorstop. And he read like that for the rest of his life. You wanted to find Grandpa, you found him in the den with a book open on his lap. So the reading, the research was very important. He was the last U.S. president we had who did not attend college. He was a self-educated man, and uh, pretty thoroughly so. Um, that first moment, you know, you, I didn't really realize who he had been or how important the job of president of the United States was. It took me, I guess it took about a year for me to sink in. I didn't figure it out until I was about seven years old. And, and it took not only being a year older, but also seeing Lyndon Johnson in his pajamas. It was Mr. Johnson's inauguration. My grandparents had been invited. They were getting older. They said, no thank you, sir. Uh, would it be okay if Margaret and the family came and represented us? And they said that would be great. So my mother and father took my younger brother William and myself to Washington. And we stayed in Blair House across the street from the White House. You all know the, uh, the facility. It's used for visiting dignitaries these days. And it's where my grandparents and my mother lived for about all of his second term because the White House was rotten, literally, not in the sense that we think it might be in, during any given administration. <laughs> now I'll tiptoe around the rest of that one. It was, the, the floor was, was falling apart. My grandfather used to be in the state dining room when he was down there with just some senators and some friends one night, and he knew my grandmother was the only one upstairs. He could see the chandelier quivering. And eventually, a, a leg of the piano punched through the floor of my mother's sitting room upstairs, and they, they got everybody out, gutted the White House, and rebuilt it all back from the inside. It's solid as a rock today, but in the early days of that renovation, they couldn't just get everybody out. They had furniture, paintings, belongings, so they ran steel rods down from the roof through the floor, of the, the second floor, to hold it up while they got everybody out. And my grandparents and my mother lived that way for a week or so. And early on in this, my grandfather took a group of reporters and photographers on a little tour to show them what was wrong and what they planned to do. And during that tour, George Thames, a New York Times photographer, remembered Grandpa stopping outside a bathroom on the second floor. And they all looked in, there's one of those steel rods run down through the floor right next to the toilet. And my grandfather looked at it and he said, you know, this thing scares the hell out of me. I'm going to be sitting in here some night and flush and wind up in the state dining room. <laughs> and you know that the Marine Band will play Hail to the Chief as I come through the ceiling. <laughs> we got... 
We got in there uh, that morning uh, to the White House. The Johnsons invited us after the inauguration, and after all the festivities. My mother and father attended all of that. And we went over to the White House to have breakfast with the Johnsons before we took our train back to New York. And mom had, you know, we were all dressed. We, we looked nice like we do this morning. No one puts on a coat and tie for breakfast anymore, I, apparently, except for the Masons. <laughs> and we all got over there, and Lady Bird Johnson greeted us. And there was a lot of hullabaloo about this, right? My mother's trying to get two kids ready. She's snapping at everybody. She's making sure the ties are straight, and everybody's <laughs> nervous wreck. And we got to the White House, and the elevator opened on the second floor, and there's Lady Bird Johnson in her nightgown. Dressing gown, nightgown, slippers, and all I could think was I had to get all dressed up for this. <laughs> and she had every hair was in place, makeup was perfect, looked like she'd been there all night waiting for us. And she showed us into the East Sitting Hall, and after a few minutes, the president came out, and he was in his pajamas and bathrobe and slippers. And he immediately endeared himself to us by, he hopped up, he knew, my brother and I, when you're in second or third grade, your teacher, you're going to take a few days off from school, your teacher will give you a special paper to write. You know, if you're going to go away, you're going to write about it. So he knew this, and he said, I got something I think will help you. And he came back, and he, he apparently cleaned out his desk. He gave us everything he could find that had his name on it. Stationery, envelopes, pens, pencils. And he reached over uh, at one point and started to drop something into our hands. And Lady Bird Johnson pulled his hand away and said, Lyndon, for God's sake, you can't give them those. Turned out he tried to give us each a book of White House matches. <laughs> when, when I wrote the book, uh, years later, the first stop on the, on the tour in 1995, the first stop was the Johnson Presidential Library in Austin, Texas. And I was a nervous wreck because there in the front row was Lady Bird Johnson and half her family. And I'm telling this nightgown story. And all I can think was, God, she's going to kill me. <laughs> you know, it was too late to go back. I was not expecting to see her. And I thought, oh, I'm dead. And we had dinner with the Johnson family and library staff on the seventh floor afterwards. And we all got a glass of wine and sat down. And she sat at the head of the table and put me on her right. And as we were all sitting down, she thwacked on her glass with her knife. And she said, before we get started, I would like to give Clifton a little something for coming here this evening. And I thought, oh, God. And then she said, hold out your hand. <laughs> and I thought, boy, she's serious about this. She hated that. So I held out my hand, and into it she dropped two books of matches. She said, I certainly hope you're old enough to have these now. <laughs> anyway, back in, back in 1965, my father looked at his watch and realized that we better go if we're going to catch a train. And he started to get up, and the president said, oh, Cliff, relax. The train will wait. And my father said, yeah, for you. <laughs> the president said, sit down, have another cup of coffee. You have plenty of time. And my father said, oh, OK. He's in the White House. He's got the president, private audience, in his pajamas. Why not? He sat down. He lost track of the time. He looked at his watch again and bolted upright. He said, we really have to be going. And we did. We ran down the corridor, got in the elevator, scooted out to the car. Even as the car is taking off, it's already after 10 o'clock in the morning, which was when our train was leaving. So my parents are beginning to wonder what to do next. You know, get to the airport, wait for another train, stay over, wait for tomorrow, whatever they were going to do. They didn't notice that the car had bypassed the front of the station and gone around back. And they pulled on, the car pulled onto a train platform. I didn't know you could do that. That's where people stand. <laughs> And the only two people there were a conductor with his watch out and a red cap with a baggage cart. And we started to throw the bags at the, at, the, at the red cap and run, and the conductor said, folks, slow down, slow down. The White House called. <laughs> the president had stopped the train. And that's when it hit me. My grandfather could stop trains. <laughs> It was, it was a, a beautiful aha moment, and, it was, and that's exactly what my grandparents did not want. They did not want me getting a swelled head about it. I was insufferable for weeks after that. <laughs> Grandpa himself, uh, as you all know, was, was, he was very modest about the powers of the presidency. They were not his. They were his to use for a certain amount of time, and then you give them back. One of his earliest heroes, Eric and I were talking about it in the car ride down here on Saturday, one of Grandpa's earliest heroes was Cincinnatus. 
And you all know the, the story of Cincinnatus. They wanted him to stay on and, and, and rule Rome after a successful military victories. And he said, no, thank you. I've done my job. I'm going home. And that's what Grandpa did. He was happy to, to give it up all at the end and go back home. There were certain things uh, I discovered that he would not do at home. Early on in 1953, when the spring came along and the grass began to grow, my grandmother looked out the window and said, Harry, you need to cut the grass. My grandfather hated yard work. So he said, yeah, I'll get to it. Uh, and she said, look, you're not president of the United States anymore. You can cut the grass again. And he said, yes, I'll, I'll do it. I'll get to it. He didn't. <laughs> and she bugged him a little more. And he said, yep, yep, it's right on the top of the to-do list. He didn't do it. She nagged him a little more. And finally, one morning, he got up, rolled up his sleeves, went out, started the mower. And my grandmother looked out the window and nearly died. It was Sunday morning, and everybody else in town is going to church past the house, and here's the former president of the United States pointedly not going to church and waving at everybody who went by. <laughs> so my grandmother ran out there and cut off the mower and said, don't you ever do that again. And he said, okay. <laughs> Years later, I got a request from the Truman Library. They said, would you write a congratula congratulatory letter to a gentleman who is 95 years old and is just retiring as, uh, as lay minister of his church? And I said, I'd be glad to do that. But why? What? I'm so I don't get the connection. They said, oh, well, he used to cut your grandfather's grass. <laughs> so Grandpa used the church to get out of mowing the lawn and then wound up hiring clergy to mow it for him. <laughs> My grandmother, and, and, in, and that, that was one of the stories that, that wound up in the first book. And in the, uh, the second book, I had to do a little more research. My grandmother was a different story. Grandpa was an open book. You, you want to know something, you just ask him. He'd tell you. And he saved a lot of what he had written down. He, sa he saved receipts. He saved bills. He saved all of this stuff. And so he, because he seriously wanted people to understand the mind of their president. And we understand a lot about what my grandfather was thinking. Because of that, there was a huge amount of, uh, of written material by him in his own hand at the Truman Library. My grandmother, the opposite. He came home. Over the course of their marriage, they must have written nearly 3,000 letters back and forth. Uh, the Truman Library has 1,360 some of his letters to her from 1910 to 1959. We only have 185 of hers back. He came home uh, one day in 1955 around Christmas and found my grandmother sitting in front of the fire, throwing in bundles of her letters to him. And he stopped her. He said, Bess, what are you doing? Think of history. And she said, oh, I have, and kept. <laughs> she, she did not want that read. That she missed these 185 was amazing. She, uh, the, the archivist at the Truman Library said it was just poor housekeeping. <laughs> she stuck them in drawers. She put them in books. They, they make a nice linear record. Uh, mostly, most of them are written between the two of them. And from 19, uh, there's only one from 1919, from World War I. The rest are from uh, 1923 through 1943. 23 to 33, of course, was when he was a county judge in Jackson County. And it's, they're written during the summer when Grandpa went off to National Guard camp. So you have the two of them. And I, I paired them in the book, Dear Harry, Love Bess. I paired them with his letters that I had, some of them that we hadn't used before. So, because I want to know why they were talking back and forth, you know, what they were saying. For example, I read one of her letters that she'd enclosed his slippers. You know, she said something like, I think you'll need them on that long walk. And I'm like, why is he walking around in slippers? Well, it turns out he had to walk down the muddy street to the showers every morning. You know, they were living in tents. So back and forth. First letter that I ever read from hers, uh, and they missed each other. They really, they wrote twice a day. Very often, I mean, there's a ton of, there's a ton of letters that are missing, but there's a lot still there that they wrote back and forth. It's like we, we text now, they wrote whole letters and sent them back and forth. And one of the uh, earliest ones, my grandmother said just after he'd left, uh, you know, last night there was a big black bug in my bed and I had to kill it myself. It wasn't the first time I'd wished for you. 
You, you never know what the subtext is going on around here. Some of it was kind of blatant. She said in one letter that she'd bought a hat for Margaret and a new nightgown for herself. And I'm like, I, you know, grandchildren really don't want to read that kind of thing. Uh, in, in keeping the nightgown vain, another letter, she had apparently gotten up at the crack of dawn just so she could watch the neighbors take off on a trip. She said to my grandfather, she said, I got up and watched them get that old car started and, and get off on their trip. She said, I wouldn't have missed seeing Mrs. Smith in knickers for $100. <laughs> so I got... I had, a different, uh, I had a different Bess Truman in these letters. I had the young Bess Truman, you know, married mother, my, my mother's mother, uh, very close relationship. She, she had, you know, she'd helped him out in the political vein. But mostly it was just good to get a window onto my grandparents that I had not seen. My, my grandmother, by the time I knew her, you know, was, was a 75, 80 year old lady who was, uh, she was the perfect grandmother. Every time my mother said, no, you can't have that, you'll put your eye out. My grandmother would wait until she'd left the room and say, how many of them do you want? <laughs> she bought us cap guns, sharp objects, it was great. Um, she was, in, in the letter vein, one of the things that started me on, on the book is that I've told stories about my grandparents uh, for years, and one of the things my grandfather could not stand was long hair on men. And my mother let us grow ours. And the year before Grandpa died, 1971, we went to the house and made the mistake of bypassing the den. You were supposed to stop at the den and say hi to Grandpa on your way through the house. You always, we always came in through the kitchen, walked through the dining room, stopped at the den, said hi, go upstairs. William and I went right upstairs with our luggage. And Grandpa saw us go by and scowled and stood up and waited. And he went to the door of the den. He waited till my mother walked past. And he stopped her and he said, who are the two long hairs walking through the house? <laughs> And my mother said, <laughs> those are your grandsons. And he didn't say anything for a couple of seconds. He said, they didn't say hello, get them down here. And she came up and she got us. She said, go say hello to your grandfather. Oh, sorry. And we went down there and grandpa was in the doorway of the den scowling. I mean, just not a happy man. And I walked up and said, hi, grandpa. And he said, what? And I said, I just came to say hello. And he looked me up and down and said, well, do it then. And I said, hello, sir. He said, hello, yourself. Same thing to William. Turned around on his heel, went back in the den. He, he had trouble speaking to us at first. I thought my grandmother was different. After I told this story a few times, the Truman Library gave me a letter that she'd written to a friend. And if, at a few years later, I had, I had they, my grandmother came to stay with us in uh, Washington after my grandfather died. And my hair by that point was down in the middle of my back. And I came down for breakfast, and my mother was making bacon and eggs across the uh, kitchen for some of my, one of my brothers. And I sat down with my grandmother, and she said in a loud voice, my goodness, you have beautiful hair. And my mother screamed and dropped the spatula. She turned around and said, mother, for God's sake, don't tell him something like that. He'll never get it cut. Sure enough, next time she asked, I said, no, Bess Truman likes my hair. <laughs> well... Years later, the Truman Library gave me a letter that she'd written to a friend of hers, and in it it said, somewhere in the middle it said, I'm so sorry that Muriel's having all that trouble with those hippies. <laughs> Seems something ought to be done about them. When I saw my own two grandsons with long hair, I nearly expired. Thank God they were clean and had on good clothing. <laughs> so it turns out she hated it every bit as much as my grandfather, but she was willing to overlook that just to annoy my mother. <laughs> So you find, you find all these wonderful things when you go, you go digging into your, your family past. And it, oddly, it's led, me, it's led me in directions also that I did not anticipate. I did not anticipate writing about my grandparents. And I certainly did not anticipate what came next, uh, which is uh, trips to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and writing about that. That is the next book project. That's what I was doing in... Uh, in Independence this last week was starting research on that, to write about my grandfather and to write about victims, many of whom I have met, to write about U.S. servicemen who were getting ready for an invasion of the Japanese main islands, so trying to get that whole story on a personal level. Um, that came about because um, I read a book about a little girl named Sadako Sasaki, who was two years old when the atomic bomb hit Hiroshima. She survived, and nine years later, was diagnosed with leukemia as a result of the radiation. She, 
she bought into a Japanese tradition that says if you fold a thousand origami paper cranes, you are granted a wish. And hers, of course, was to cure herself. Um, it did not. She folded about 1,300 cranes, uh, but died of leukemia in October of 1955. Her brother, Masahiro, has been using her story ever since as a gesture of peace and reconciliation. Masahiro is a survivor of Hiroshima himself. I told that story to a Japanese journalist years ago, and the phone rang one day, and it was Masahiro Sasaki, who said, I understand that you read my sister's story, and you read it with your children, which I had. It's a children's book. And he said, I'd like to meet you someday. And I said, likewise, let's just see if we can make that happen. It took a few years. We finally met in May of 2010 in New York, where Masahiro and his son Yuji were donating one of those last paper cranes that Sadako folded herself to the World Trade Center Memorial. And they said on that visit, would you come to Hiroshima? And I said, yes. And they said, well, okay, if you're gonna do that, we're gonna donate another of those cranes to the USS Arizona, which they did two days ago. So they have made that donation, Yuji was out there for it, and I went to Hiroshima this last, uh, this last August 6th, the 9th, for the memorial ceremonies and to meet with survivors. That's essentially what we did. We took part in the ceremonies and met with people who had survived. And they are remarkable people. Not everybody wanted to meet me. Uh, and, and one of the first questions I got asked by a young Nagasaki reporter was, are you here to apologize? <laughs> to which I said, no. And she kept at it and kept at it. I kept, we kept on the theme of reconciliation and understanding, which was the whole point. But generally, it was a very good visit. There's one of these, one of the men, one of the survivors named Mr. Ito, lost his brother in Hiroshima and lost his son at the World Trade Center. And one of the traditions that they have in Hiroshima is at the end of the day on August 6th, they light paper lanterns in memory of those who died. Many of them died in the river trying to escape the fires. And they send these lanterns down the river and out to the sea. And Mr. Ito had made one with his brother on one side and his son on the other. And he asked me and my family to join him and his family to light this and send it down the river together, which we did. Um, another gentleman, Mr. Mori, Shigeki Mori, was a victim of the atomic bombs, um, yet he knew that the 12 US servicemen had died in that attack in Hiroshima. Nobody in this country knew what had happened to them. They had been shot down. I think two different airplane crews had been shot down. They were being held at the police headquarters in Hiroshima and they died in the bombing, and because there was a blackout on information about the bombings, because you know, the rebuilding after the war, they didn't want a lot of that information out, no one knew what had happened. Their families had no idea, and Mr. Morey spent a good deal of his own time and money over the next 20 or 30 or 40 years tracking down the family members in this country of those servicemen so that they would know what had happened to their sons and husbands. So, remarkable group of people, and I'm looking forward to working on that. Um, I think I should probably leave you with um, something a bit more fun about Grandpa. Uh, one of the things I always, and I, I think he would, I'm always wondering when I do projects like this, I'm always wondering what, what he would say and what he would do and whether I'm headed in the right direction. Um, and uh, so far I think I'm on pretty good footing and I've, uh, you all have been, uh, those that I've talked to about this project have been, uh, have been supportive and uh, I, I shouldn't have expected anything else from Masons. And I think that so much of my grandfather's success as a judge, as a senator, and as president of the United States was because he was a Mason first. And he brought so much of that to his handling of the, the powers that were given to him. Uh, he always followed Mark Twain's quote, always uh, do right. You will gratify a few people and astound everybody else. Um, and I think that was very true of him. He remained himself to the end of his life. He was, uh, he was accessible. He would talk to people. And until 1963, there was no Secret Service surrounding him. That fence that's around, that steel fence, five-foot fence around the house, was put up by the Secret Service in 1946. Grandpa didn't like it much. Uh, my grandmother hated having a Secret Service around. But in the early days, Grandpa was very accessible when he was back in Independence. Uh, and one of my favorite stories that I'll leave you with is 
there was a guy driving by the house one morning and his car blew a tire. And he didn't know where he was. There wasn't a sign out front that said Truman Home like it does today. It was just a nice big white house with a fence around it. And he walked through the front gate and he walked up the, to the door and he rang the bell and Grandpa answered the door. And the guy said, I got a flat. Can I use your phone? Grandpa said, sure, come on in. The guy called the local garage and the garage said it's going to take us about 20 minutes to get over there. And the guy said, that's fine. I'll wait for you. And he hung up the phone and he said to Grandpa, I'll be out by the car. Thank you. And Grandpa said, no, 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 don't sit down. And they sat in the living room and talked for 15 or 20 minutes. Apparently got along just fine. And then a wrecker pulled up out front and the guy stood up and he said, I better get out there. And Grandpa said, good luck. And the guy said, thank you. I appreciate the, uh, the help and the hospitality. It was nice talking to you. Nice to meet you. And Grandpa said, likewise. And they shook hands and the man walked out the front door and he got halfway down the steps. And he stopped and he turned and he looked back up. He said, you know something? And I hope you won't take offense but you look a hell of a lot like that SOB, Harry Truman. <laughs> and Grandpa just smiled at him <laughs> and leaned in and said, I am that SOB. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.